hop on because this is really going to be a treat. Uh, we're going to hear from some, we have an incredible uh, show today. I guess it's a show. It's a presentation. And, and we're going to get started and dive right in. So first want to just start by recognizing that it's Pride Month. And yesterday was Juneteenth. And the ongoing struggle for LGBTQ equality and racial justice is central to our work at MVP. Um, thank you all for being here. Huge thank you to the MVP team for all the work uh, to make this happen. Thank you to all the donors who've already given this year. Thank you. You did the right thing. You gave early. Um, and now you can spread the word. And it, it helps us when you give early because then we can bother other people. Um, and if you haven't given yet, this is the perfect time to give. This is all of our lives and future and everything on the line. So think big. Um, and also want to just super shout out and thank our super volunteers from Eastern Mass, Western Mass, Washington, the Bay Area, and all over the country who have been organizing. We're not just a staff, we're a staff and volunteers that are making this happen together. So let's dive right into the agenda. Um, and we're gonna start out by just grounding ourselves in the bigger picture. Then my colleague, Hallie Montoya Tanzi is gonna introduce our partners from Ohio and New York. And our colleague, John Anner is gonna bring it all home. So what are we doing today? We are building a progressive decade which comes down to 2024. And over the next 16 months, or 16 months from now, a little over 16 months from now, we're most likely going to be living in one of two scenarios. Scenario A is a MAGA trifecta. And I don't need to tell you how terrible this would be. Scenario B is a democratic trifecta in which we have the opportunity to pass game-changing legislation that we weren't able to pass in 2021, including voting rights, national redistricting reform. This is a, we have a 10-year version of this, but no one wants to wait 10 years for a progressive decade when we can make this happen now. So if we play our cards right two years from now, two years from now, we could be on our way to a progressive decade. And we're on a knife's edge we could really end up in either of these scenarios or something in between. And it will probably be decided by a couple thousand votes, just like it was the last two presidential elections. Same with the House and Senate. Can you believe this whole McCarthy nightmare we're living through was caused by less than 7,000 votes across five House districts? We need to make sure that that never happens again. And MVP partners are the ones to do it. They've helped win so many close races, often in places that are not the top battleground states that everyone else is investing in. And that brings us to our topic for today, the House and the Senate and the special role that Ohio and New York have to play in flipping the House and saving the Senate, as well as lots of other things that you're going to hear about today from Misha and Sasha. Obviously, there are a lot of other states that will matter too, like Montana and the Senate, California and the House, and many more. The good news is that MVP is targeting all the closest presidential House and Senate races in 2024. And of course, because we're MVP, it doesn't just mean we're trying to win elections by buying TV ads. It means winning elections by investing in actual human beings, local organizers, and communities who are going to get out new voters to win at the margins. MVP, next slide, please. <laughs> there we go. MVP in, invests in collaborative state ecosystems. Typically, our state advisors are investing in 30 to 40 organizations in each of our top priority states and doing deep capacity building and support for the entire ecosystem. And that's where most of our focus is in states like Wisconsin, Georgia, Arizona, the perennial battleground states. I'm just slowing up, showing off the next slide, please. But today, to mix things up a little, we're going to focus on the reddish state of Ohio and the bluish state of New York. And here to talk about that is my awesome colleague, Hallie Montoya Tanzi, Senior State Strategy Advisor, who's responsible for over 30 states, basically all of our non-tier one states, including Ohio and New York, as well as states like Virginia and Kentucky that have big elections coming up this fall, as well as states like Nevada and many more, which collectively contain a majority of the competitive house races. So 
a quick thing, uh, a comment you hear often about Hallie around MVP is like, we don't know how she does it with over 30 states, but somehow she does, passing it to you, Hallie, to give some context and introduce our partners from New York and Ohio. Hallie? Awesome. Thank you so much for um, that introduction, Billy. So yeah, I'm excited today to tell you a little bit more about what's going on right now in Ohio and New York, uh, where really critical efforts uh, supportive of that broader vision are happening. The first state we want to talk about today is Ohio. Um, and so I wanted to just give a bit of context before we introduce our, our partner, Misha Barnes with Ohio Progressive Collaborative. So Ohio, this cycle is having, in our view, a really existential moment. It is a moment where Ohio has the potential to either come closer back to its prior status as a top tier battleground state or slide down the hill into Iowa and Indiana town as sort of a more entrenched red state in, you know, red Republican stronghold in the Midwest. As you may remember, Ohio, you know, until very recently was a top tier battleground and a true presidential bellwether picking the winning presidential candidate every cycle between 1964 and 2020, where they went a second time for Bush by a large margin, really bucking the national trend there. Um, it is no coincidence that in recent years, Ohio Republicans have been systematically restricting voting access for residents, reducing days and hours for early voting, um, and eventually recently enacting one of the nation's most restrictive voter ID laws. The state's gerrymandering, which has kept Republicans in the majority, has also proved resistant to reform. One of the very last pathways to progressive change in the state is the initiative process. It is through that process that Ohioans still have the power to turn things around and win in the state, whether that's through protecting abortion rights or pushing back against these anti-democracy moves that Republicans have been making or taking redistricting out of Republican hands. The, the way that that stuff happens is through ballot initiatives in Ohio, and there are plans to do all the things I just mentioned and more, which Misha will tell you more about. Republicans, unfortunately, know this. That's why they've crafted a dastardly plan that will take away this one last check on their power, uh, potentially in August, by raising the threshold to win a ballot initiative from 50% to 60%. Those 10%... That is like huge in the land of ballot initiatives. It means it goes from many things are possible to very few things are possible um, when you raise that threshold to 60%. Um, thankfully, Misha Barnes and our partners um, at the Ohio Progressive Collaborative and at one per the One Person, One Vote campaign uh, have a plan to prevent the Republicans from winning this special election. Um, on the day Republicans voted to put it on the ballot, this coalition, this campaign had legislators and protesters in the Capitol chanting in unison, one person, one vote, one person, one vote. On that same day, they launched the one person, one vote campaign with a website with over 70 groups signed up. As you'll hear from Misha, that coalition has grown by leaps and bounds since then. They're so well organized. They're so strategic. They're ready to take this initiative down in, um, in August. And I just want to leave you with one last thought about it, which is that earlier this year, Lots of donors and organizations were rightly very focused on Wisconsin Supreme Court race, abortion, democracy, redistricting, all those things were on the line in Wisconsin. We had a big victory there. We're so proud of that and the support we were able to offer to our partners on the ground. Guess what? Now in Ohio, a state with twice as many people as Wisconsin, all the same things are on the line. Um, and we know that we need everyone's help to win this. Uh, and here's Misha now to tell us how. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, uh, my name is Nisha Barnes, and I run the donor table in Ohio. And I'm here today with my colleague, Hannah Tyler, who you can't see, but will be helping, asking, uh, helping me answer any questions or comments in the chat. Um, so we started the donor table in 2018 with the purpose of addressing structural barriers in Ohio and making voting easier. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on the donor table because I really wanna focus in on, on what's happening in Ohio right now. In May, the Ohio legislature approved a resolution to place a legislatively referred ballot initiative before voters in an August special election. This proposed amendment would shred the constitution and raise our threshold for passing constitutional amendments to 60% rather than a simple majority, which um, Ohioans have had for more than a century. Uh, in this past lame duck session, the Ohio legislature voted to eliminate special elections altogether, but here we are. 
um, they decided to push this proposed amendment to a special election, despite it being illegal, because they're hoping for low voter turnout. Next slide, please. One reliable thing about Republicans in Ohio is um, just that they will avoid anything even approaching a fair fight. They see a host of ballot measures coming their way, everything from real redistricting reform to reproductive rights, and they know our positions have popular support in Ohio. There's a path to get things back on track in Ohio, as, as Hallie mentioned, and that path runs through ballot measures. So by putting this unpopular measure in front of voters and what they expect to be a low turnout election, a random election in August, they're attempting to also take out all these potential reforms at the same time. So a question I get constantly about Ohio is how did Ohio become a red state so fast? And what I want you to understand is we're not a red state. We're not a, we, are, we are a non-voting state, we're a gerrymandered state, we're a suppressed state. In the last decade, 2.5 million voters have been purged in Ohio. To give you a sense of that number, our incumbent governor wins with 2 million votes. So of the 2.5 million voters who have been purged, no one here is going to be surprised that they are majority black, brown, and young folks. That shows that the Republican elected officials in Ohio are scared of a fair fight. The fix to this is expanding voting laws and adding like automatic voter registration in same day. When Republicans saw that Ohioans passed two redistricting reforms with overwhelming support, they ignored the state constitution and looked to newly Trump appointed federal judges to bail them out. When Ohioans elected three Democrats statewide to the Ohio Supreme Court, the Republicans in the General Assembly changed the rules only for those judicial elections. So, no, we were not surprised when Republicans put a restriction to make ballot measures harder on a special election when they just outlawed special elections in December. And I can understand that maybe that feels demoralizing, but that's really not the sentiment on the ground. People are fed up. People want to fight. People recognize that this is a step too far. So before I get into our one person, one vote campaign, I want to talk briefly about our opposition's campaign. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. Uh, in terms of our opposition, we've continued to hear uh, about the Vote Yes campaign's fundraising approach, which I'll share is a little different than ours. Um, Matt Huffman, the Senate president in Ohio, who's also the most powerful Republican in the state, is using redistricting maps and the state budget as a threat to get donations for folks to vote to support the vote yes effort. So you heard that right, redistricting maps and uh, the state budget. So um, the vote yes campaign has been full of leaks, some of which have been covered in the media. Huffman has indicated that our side is just some disorganized Democrats and grassroots groups, and he doesn't expect us to be able to raise enough money to be a threat. Um, and as Matt Huffman has been bullying businesses and lobbyists, we had a group of 27 Ohio business leaders issue an op-ed supporting our Vote No campaign just last week. And um, maybe Hannah can drop that in the chat. Um, this letter was not only taking a stand for democracy in Ohio, but it's also in opposition to the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, always co-signing the draconian laws moving through our state house. And our next slide, please. So in addition to the business leaders, um, I'm excited to show we have over 160 organizations in Ohio that make up the one person, one vote campaign. We cannot even fit them all on this slide anymore. So when I told you earlier that folks are fed up with the Republicans consistently changing the rules to benefit them, this list is proof of that. Next slide, please. Um, and the election is coming quickly. Since the General Assembly passed a law changing the Constitution, the law has to go before voters in the statewide election. The General Assembly egregiously created a random date for this election, which is August 8th, and so that means early vote starts on July 11th. The voter registration deadline for the special election is July 10th. And in the midst of this, we also have activists in Ohio who've been working on a ballot measure to codify abortion access. And those petitions for the citizen initiated amendment are due July 5th. So this is all happening very fast. Next slide. 
Um, so here's a snapshot of the field programming that's happening in Ohio right now. I want to point out a silver lining that um, just in this battle to protect ballot access is it's actually allowing us to organize and talk to voters earlier in the cycle than we've been funded to do in uh, at least a decade. So we're building capacity not only for this special election, the abortion ballot measure in November, but this also benefits Sherrod in 2024. We also get to fully coordinate on ballot measures. So the organizations that our donor table has supported for years, like the Ohio Organizing Collaborative, led by Princess Haney and Molly Shack, and Innovation Ohio, our comms hub, led by Desiree Timms, and Ohio Citizen Action with Kyle Markham, they now get to work with the state party and chairwoman Liz Walters for the first time. So there's also big benefit and learning going into 2024 because the hard and soft sides will have a better understanding of each other's work. Next slide. Um, in addition to the field efforts that um, were on the last slide, the One Person, One Vote campaign is doing regional media events across the state and including smaller media markets like you see listed here to raise awareness. Um, and anecdotally, I'll say like last week, we had 70 people show up to an event in Appalachia to apply pressure. So we're, we're pretty excited at the response that we're getting, um, not just of the press stories, but even the people attending um, press events. Um, next slide. And these are just a few highlights of some of the uh, press coverage that we've been getting. So far, um, there has not been a major news endorsement of the vote yes. Everything is going to the vote no in protecting the Constitution. And I think we've got one more slide here of just our, our field efforts and action. So here, I wanna share a little bit about the budget. Um, our opposition is looking to raise at least 10 million. Um, and we've seen some news stories about um, an Illinois billionaire that's been publicly funding them, has moved at least a million. We do not have a campaign finance report until July 31st, so we aren't going to have specifics on that. But um, we know that we need to raise uh, or that we need to at least match them. So with that in mind, um, we still have a gap of $2.6 million to close. And we're going to drop information about how to contribute in the chat. Um, and with that, I want to turn things back to Hallie. Awesome. Thank you so much for um, that update on how the campaign is going. Um, it's, yeah, it's really impressive what you all have put together. Um, I think since August, since August is so close now, I just wanted to ask you, Misha, if you could sort of hit the highlights of what what do you think the most important marks are for us to hit um, sort of collectively in order to ensure we have the best chance possible of winning in August? Um, our, our priorities are funding these in-state organizations and our in-state partners that you saw on the field slide. Um, that allows us to, to staff up certainly for this August special, which you saw like the tight timeline that we're on, it's really hard to build capacity that quickly. But then we turn around and have the next fight in November on the abortion ballot measure. And then we get to maintain that and carry that through for Sherrod. And um, to be honest, we were concerned about how we were going to build capacity for sharing going into this year because Ohio's seen divestment over the last decade. And a lot of our really incredible leaders here haven't had a chance to work in cycles as large as what we're going to experience in 2024. So we have been viewing this all as opportunity. It's an opportunity to support these leaders, to support Sherrod, to recruit and train volunteers on these like the most critical elections of our, our, of our decade. So um, the metrics that we're really focusing on are on the volunteer recruitment for these individual organizations, building st staff capacity, and our priority at the donor table is making sure that the organizations in state have plans to be successful in August but also November and going forward. <clears throat> um, 
sorry for coughing and awesome. That makes a ton of sense. And I, I really want us to be there to build, help those support those organizations to build that capacity and also to be there for them in, you know, what might not be as big of a lull as we expected to have bleeding into 24, but I'm sure there will be some moments where it will feel maybe after August, or maybe that's too soon, but then after November, there will be some periods where um, there's not, you know, right around the corner of the next priority. And I hope as much as possible, we can be there to help support these organizations to keep folks on so they don't have to disband the dream team they've built and rehire and disband and rehire. Um, I think that that feels like it'll really put us in a good position going into next year as well. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much, Misha. Um, and now we're going to switch gears um, to hear some about New York. So um, New so basically, if, you, if you had told you a year ago that we would be featuring New York in a briefing about battleground federal election priorities, I'm sure it would have surprised many people. Uh, but last fall, as many of you know, I saw there's a bunch of New Yorkers in uh, in the briefing today. So um, I'm sure you're aware New York played a somewhat surprising role in the midterm election. We lost more competitive elections for the U.S. House there than we did anywhere else in the country with California, California right up there as well. Um, these, you know, blue states are large, they're heterogeneous, and they also contain purple geographies, red geographies, and um, they're so large that there are places there without, you know, sustained organizing infrastructure. Um, and so I, I'll say there's many factors that led to this outcome in New York, including a confusing and long redistricting process. I heard um, folks in state there call it a comapstrophe, a mapatastrophe, um, a crowded election calendar with lots of primaries that left voters a bit fatigued. Um, there was effective work by New York Republicans to frame the stakes of the election and to motivate their base. But one factor that stood out, especially to us at, M at MVP and to our, par and our partners on the ground was underinvestment in organizing infrastructures in geographies on Long Island, the Hudson Valley and upstate where we now expect to have competitive U.S. House elections for likely the next eight years and, you know, potentially beyond. Um, there's obviously a lot of great organizing that's being being done and that has been done in New York as a whole, but by and large, these particular geographies within the state haven't gotten the same level of investment in year-round organizing that you'd see in a purple state. Um, thankfully, a powerful effort has come together to fix that. Battleground New York brings together unions, advocacy organizations, longstanding local community organizations like MVP partners, including Make the Road and Citizen Action, uh, as well as the Working Families Party and a coordinated effort. Many of these organizations have, over the last 10 years, led an extremely effective effort to ungridlock the New York State Legislature and build and sustain a progressive majority there. So they've got a proven track record. And now through Battleground New York, they're going to make sure that we can win uh, these excuse me, that we can hold these Republican representatives accountable for the harm they're doing in Congress. We can frame the elections on our terms and we can ultimately win the next round and the rounds after that. Even better, this year round organizing infrastructure in these contested geographies rooted in local efforts will help us develop local leaders, hold on to progressive majorities um, in the state legislature and in um, municipalities there, win winning local battles in these places as well. And I'm so happy to introduce Sas Sasha Ahuja from the New York Working Families Party, who is going to tell us more about Battleground New York. Thanks. Thanks, Haley. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of folks are coming off of a hopefully reflective and restful Juneteenth weekend uh, right back into our work. Uh, also, thank you, Misha, for being on. Uh, have been watching and supporting and cheerleading uh, our friends in Ohio, who I know have uh, quite a fight ahead. Uh, and I know that we're ready and we're resilient. So thank you for all your work. Um, my name is Sasha Ahuja, uh, serving in the deputy director role at the New York Working Families Party um, with a focus on our work uh, in Congress in 2024. And as Haley said, if I told you months ago that New York is a battleground state, uh, you might look at me sideways and say, what are you talking about? You have a you know a super majority in both houses um, in your state legislature, you have a democratic governor, um, and we know uh, we all saw what we saw 
in November 2022. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit as Haley framed of um, our work, uh, scary photo here in my slide, um, our work to build the infrastructure that is so sorely lacking in our state um, that unfortunately we oftentimes take for granted. Um, I will say uh, I come out of the reproductive health rights and justice movement, uh, most recently serving in leadership at Planned Parenthood, uh, where we know um, abortion was incredibly salient this cycle uh, or last cycle and will continue to be into 2024. Um, and so I'll talk to you all a little bit of um, the structure and the shape of our work. Um, I see some important questions already in the chat, so we're eager to get to those uh, and all of the efforts that are showing up. So let's get to the first slide um, in terms of what actually happened. I know this is not news to many of you who are fairly plugged in, but I'll give a little bit of a voiceover. Um, so as you all know, the red wave uh, very surprisingly did not hit the majority of the country, but it did make waves here in New York where we saw a 14 point swing um, of our electorate towards Republicans, largely because our folks stayed home. Um, there were a number of reasons for that. Haley alluded to um, a very confusing cycle around redistricting, split primaries, lots of confusion as to what was and was not happening, um, a strong opposition message from Republicans uh, and a Republican gubernatorial candidate weaponizing people's fears around crime, uh, largely that was manufactured, largely sort of pointing to a reality across our state, um, comparing this moment to decades ago, uh, very deeply unequal and deeply racialized um, equivalencies that were being made, but ones that we nonetheless knew um, the media narrative was very much so capturing, um, and also a um, a little bit of a lack of enthusiasm for the top of the ticket on the Democratic side. So lots of conditions that played into um, the reality of what we saw in um, November 22, and um, we have our work cut out for us. Um, I'm going to jump to the next slide. So here is our sad reality of many of the, what we all know. So we have five new members of Congress. Uh, here in New York in these new newly redrawn districts. Um, Santos in Long Island, yes, Esposito also on Long Island, uh, two seats in the Hudson Valley, um, and then uh, New York 22 uh, in Central New York upstate. So five Republicans who now uh, are part of the New York delegation that um, parade to be moderates when they are back home, but vote with MAGA Republicans when they are in Washington. Also, New York 18 in the Mid-Hudson is a seat that um, continues to be vulnerable. Pat Ryan ran um, a race that really led in, uh, leaned into um, in a message of um, pro-reproductive health rights and justice. And um, we expect that to be a heavily targeted race from our opposition. So when we're looking at the map in New York, we're talking about six seats. Um, and this was said sort of broadly, but I will say our ability to take back the House um, in November 2024 runs through the Empire State. It is dependent on our ability to ensure that all of these six districts, which are all Biden plus districts, um, that our base, that our people, that our communities are turning out, uh, that understand very clearly exactly who represents them. Again, folks that posture to be moderates when they're in district, but in reality vote with Kevin McCarthy in Washington um, and do not represent the will of um, the people. Um, or their constituents. And so that is our work to be done. We can jump to the next slide. Um, so here's a little bit of a district analysis. I'm not gonna get to the nitty gritty, um, but what we aim to share here is um, the margins are quite small in terms of numbers of folks that ultimately turned out and the work to be done. Uh, and so we zoomed into New York 22, um, where you see um, there's a pretty, a pretty, a fairly split vote between Democrats and the GOP, um, but a much greater turnout among Republicans in New York 22 um, in 2022 last year, um, where again, some of the factors that we described were what contributed to that drummed up turnout. But um, just two years prior, um, the district went for Biden, although somewhat narrowly, but not a huge um Distinction there, um, the, the district went for Biden in 2020. So even in a place like central New York, where we assume perhaps folks' politics are slightly more moderate, 
um, lots of democratic enthusiasm, uh, we just lost folks. And we did, we did not have the infrastructure in spite of having a leaderful movement of across our state of organizations that do deep organizing and deep work, um, not enough resources and not enough infrastructure to reach our people. And our job is to change that. Um, so we will jump to the next slide. Um, so this work has already started. Um, as we said, we are making sure, um, and I'll describe who we is in just a moment, but um, a group of organizations have come together um, really to activate the grassroots and the field to make sure that we are holding Republicans accountable for all of the decisions that they are making that are going against the interests of their constituents. Um, just this spring, we stood up a number of actions um, around the debt ceiling fight, around the um, uh, you know threats to SNAP, to Medicare, um, to all of the things that uh, we know voters hold very, very dear uh, that impact people's pocketbooks and bottom lines, um, and that MAGA Republicans who are now in these seats um, are threatening to cut um, to balance a budget on the backs of New Yorkers, and that that is unacceptable. So um, we held a number of actions this spring, really to begin to educate folks, uh, to get some press attention locally. Um, you'll see the press clips here, work that we did outside of Congressman Molinar's office um, around the debt ceiling. Um, when uh, Kevin McCarthy came to um, New York to raise money uh, and was joined um, uh, by um, Mike Lawler there, we made sure that we were very present um, and that we're making those connections directly, um, educating folks, getting some press, uh, getting some national press, in fact, around these actions. Again, putting the, placing the blame squarely where it belongs. You can jump to the next slide. Um, and again, to jump to uh, New York 22 around some accountability um, actions and just noting lots of chatter in the chat. So we'll make sure we get to those really important questions um, that, uh, again, that same accountability strategy to make sure that these newly elected Republicans um, are being held accountable and their positions on Medicare, Social Security and things that are wildly popular are really clear. Um, uh, Representative Williams in New York 22, newly elected Republican, uh, did not want to talk to voters at all, did not want to hold a town hall. And so um, through the capacity of grassroots groups around the state, um, we made sure that we were sending hundreds of letters to his office, um, called on him to hold a town hall, uh, none of which were in uh, the major cities that are in his district, but held town halls nonetheless. Um, uh, we did some early polling to demonstrate that his positions on um, Social Security and Medicare that he was negotiating to um, uh, in around the debt ceiling fight were wildly unpopular, uh, made that really clear, pitched some press around that work. Um, and so that work has, again, already begun the slow churn to educate, engage, um, and inform voters locally. You can jump to the next slide. Um, here you'll see the town hall that Representative Williams had held begrudgingly, full house in spite of the town hall being held in a more rural part of the district, and again, making sure that we were incredibly present. Um, you can jump to the next slide. Okay, so um, here's a little bit of where we are. Uh, we are here, we're spring ends tomorrow, spring 2023. Um, we are um, pulling together the infrastructure of a table that we are calling Battleground New York. Uh, I'll go through a visual in just a sec uh, in just a second um, around the partners, but here's some of the key work that we are beginning to do together. Um, I'll pause and say a lot of things are being called Battleground New York. Uh, all of a sudden, we are like adopting a new name as a state um, to make it really, really clear. You may have heard of the other efforts out there. This effort, unlike those, um, is one that is exclusively focused on field and priming, knocking on doors, priming our people, beginning to talk to them now, um, separate and apart from the other incredibly important efforts that are also uh, being led on the independent expenditure side. We've heard uh, the significant investment that House Majority PAC is making in New York on the um, state party side. Uh, someone mentioned as well, there's an effort um, to ramp up a coordinated campaign in alignment with the New York State Democratic Party. All of these things are urgent. All of these things are needed. And the thing that we are building through Battleground New York is a grassroots table that is engaging all of our partners around the state. And again, we'll talk through the structure of that in just a second to be able to really do that deep voter education from organizations and individuals 
and activists, they're not going to leave after November 2024. Oftentimes, elections make us excited and we build momentum through them. And then the infrastructure that we built crumbles because we're not, you know, holding on to the sustainability that we need. And if we learned anything from November 22, it's that uh, this work needs to be long term. We need to begin to adopt the infrastructure that our partners around the country have adopted to actually retain and win um, progressive victories around the state so that, um, as Haley said, we're not continuing to fight these embattled fights for decades on decades, but instead are really building the infrastructure that starts to churn and is year round. Um, so this is what this year looks like, that accountability work you see in orange um, here. Uh, and um, so that's already begun. I've begun to describe that. We've begun donor organizing work. Uh, and this is part of that work with all of you. Um, we have just begun a cadence uh, with partners around New York State, and again, are eager to make sure that everyone here is included. Um, we've just begun a cadence because lots of folks are now interested in New York, uh, and we know that the five partners who are kind of holding the center of the strategy are not the only ones that are driving work, but instead are just some of the partners that have statewide reach, have base, have members, um, and have the capacity to engage uh, around New York. And um, so we're beginning to make sure that um, we have some partners are being engaged biweekly, um, that they have some key messages of, of what's happening in Congress, key messages around accountability um, and work that's happening at home, um, and then um, can really help to turn out folks district by district in coordinated ways. So we're not stepping on each other and getting in each other's way, but really amplifying each other's actions. Um, so uh, we are planning for a public campaign launch. You'll see in yellow um, in about the middle of your slide in summer 23, scaling peer, paid volunteer and canvas um, operations. Our next big peak moment um, is August recess when folks will be back home um, that we're building volunteer capacity and shaping the work. Um, but then into next year, a firewall will go up as it goes and we'll run uh, sort of similar strategies, but um, of course compliant both on the IE and coordinated side. So an aggressive strategy that is starting now, we have uh, the luxury of, of a little bit of time, which um, oftentimes we find ourselves in a rush, but uh, we have about 18 months to go and but we know this work needs to start now. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is the structure that we are building. Um, so you'll see five anchor partners that are named here, um, our partners in labor, which we're so incredibly happy about, 1199 and CDN Communication Workers of America, um, our friends in Repro, Planned Parenthood, Empire State Acts, um, Indivisible. I saw a question in the chat whether Indivisible is engaged. They absolutely are. Um, they've been incredible partners in the initial accountability work that we've done. Um, and the New York Working Families Party with some support from National. That sort of center is then um, uh, helping to build capacity in a regional structure that will be stood up this summer, um, we, where you see uh, regional tables in Long Island, in the Hudson Valley, in the Southern Tier, and in Central New York um, that are going to drive work together. So this is a little bit of the ambitious structure that we are building. Again, time affords us um, some spaciousness to build and really meet our communities where they are. We have a leaderful movement and um, network of organizations, uh, and what we continue to need is sustained funding and support to make sure that we're priming voters now, that we are not taking our state for granted. Um, we are a very uh, heterogeneous state. We are have a many, many pockets of blue uh, and also some purple states and some red states in our empire state. And so all of those folks need to be engaged. And again, just really want to emphasize the five organizations that are named here are hardly the or only organizations that are doing work. They are organizations that have capacity in these districts, have members and have base. And so again, we're engaging a much wider set of partners that Cadence just kicked off um, last week. Folks are convening again on Thursday. Uh, we're so thrilled to be able to invite those of you that are activists and organizers and representing organizations um, to join us. And I'll drop a link as to how to engage there. Um, but we would be thrilled to continue to build the base of um, grass tops leaders that are going to help to mobilize folks around some key work um, this summer. So uh, great ambitious plans. And we are um, thrilled to be working with folks um, in this work. You can jump to the next slide. 
Um, this is a little bit of the budget that we put together. Um, I'll lift up the key number that you should pay attention to. So we're estimating um, about $4.2 million just for a modest amount of work. Uh, this is a modest budget, but for a modest plan now through um, March, 2024, um, again, this is not the full election cycle, it just, just gets us through the first quarter of 2024. And we're uh, hoping to continue to reach out to all of you, uh, engage all of you to meet a major deadline that we have by the end of next week to raise 750 um, to be able to execute um, our accountability work this summer into the fall, again, with August recess being that next big peak. So a little bit of our budget and how we're thinking about staffing and capacity um, and um, uh, an ask uh, that will come your way a little bit more formally um, for the fundraising work ahead. Um, you can jump to the next slide, which I think wraps us up. Uh, that's all I have. I'm so thrilled to share this work. It is emergent, it is exciting. Uh, it is a little bit different than what we hear oftentimes around um, what's ahead and also the road to the house. Uh, the road to taking back the house runs through New York. So thrilled to be able to partner with MVP in those efforts and all of you as this work takes shape. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Haley. Thank you so much for that presentation. I I heard a lot of excitement about those slides, so I'm happy we'll be sharing them. I myself really liked seeing the structure laid out so clearly. Um, I wanted, you actually did a great job answering some questions that had come up with, come up in the chat during your presentation. I just wanted to lift up one that um, we could dig a little deeper on, I think, which is just, um, there was a question in there about like how the issue of crime and safety was framed, you know, by Republicans and what a productive response to that might be in New York. And I guess even more broadly, what do you want us to have our folks focusing on message wise? Like what what do you imagine at this point um, a winning framing messaging wise might look like in New York? It's such a good question and such an important one. Um, and the ways in which crime is weaponized in a deeply, deeply racialized way, oftentimes by spokespeople like the mayor, my mayor of New York City, uh, not particularly helpful for us to win. Um, these are the key questions that we're looking to answer uh, now. Um, there's been, you know, some research coming out of Pennsylvania, especially, uh, for example, where uh, we saw John Fetterman continue to stick to a generally progressive message on crime and win a race in Pennsylvania that we all paid a ton of attention to. Um, and so I think there's some lessons from 2022 that we are taking. Um, we're working with some partners to, you know, before the consultant and polling class start to shape a narrative in these races, um, actually focusing in on some key messages and how to talk about um, uh, safety, um, public safety, community safety, not just crime, but actually what it actually means for people to feel safe um, and, you know, some more explicit framing there. Um, and so that is a work in progress. I don't have a cookie cutter answer for folks today, but this is the work that we're doing now. Um, to help to also guide candidates that are going to, you know, continue to, that are beginning both rumored and also um, already in the field um, around how they can message to their communities, um, again, around this really important question of what are the tools, the resources that people need to really feel safe. We know the safest communities are not the ones with the most cops, they're the ones that um, have the most resources and the most support for people. So how to turn that into a campaign message that resonates is our work in progress right now. Allie, I think you're muted. Whoops. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sasha. That is um, such important work and we're so grateful that you all are focused on it. I think now I will uh, turn it over to John Anner. John is a member of MVP's donor team. He has been a really great partner in this work, uh, collaborating with me so far this year on a strategy to support the uh, the efforts that you just heard about, as well as our um, longstanding community partners in New York. Uh, John's based in Long Island and um, has been making some really um, powerful connections and collaborations happen out there. And I uh, would love to just pass it to you, John. Thanks. 
Thanks, Hallie. And thanks so much, Sasha and Misha, for those presentations. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to see so many folks that I know who've been part of MVP for years and just participating as we go forward into this new world. Um, so actually, before I joined the staff of MVP, I was a donor to the organization, and I knew a little bit about the model, and I'm just going to tell a little bit about my story about how I got here so you can understand. Um, I'm from New York originally, and then when I was in grammar school in the 1960s, my parents moved to Greenwich, Connecticut. So my remit covers New York and Greenwich because why not? My mom still lives there. Um, but I have spent most of my career working overseas. I've uh, spent years in West Africa. I spent um, a decade and a half in Vietnam and, and uh, other parts of Southeast Asia. And as I was uh, switching over to doing some consulting work, um, I moved back to New York City and I got connected again with the Movement Voter Project. Um, and I started, I got invited to do a little organizational development consulting. And so I got involved. And the more deeply I started to understand the model, the more excited I got about what MVP was doing. I just had no idea how much money the Movement Voter Project was investing around the country. But in particular, it wasn't the quantity of money. It was the kind of money and who it was going to. It was going to fund these grassroots organizations that were building power over the long term, the way that both Misha and Sasha described, those early investments that um, deliver results a year out or two years out or five years out, I thought that model was really fascinating. And so as I was finishing up my consulting work, I got offered this spectacular job uh, working again in West Africa for an organization I really admire. And at the same time, I was talking with Billy and others at the Movement Voter Project, and I just came to this realization that at this point in my career, I was not, uh, I, what I really wanted to do was invest all the time and energy I had left um, to trying to save and preserve American democracy and to work with these fabulous organ organizations all around the country. So I turned down that job and I came to work for the Movement Voter Project. I was offered that job in October of last year. And I was told, well, your job is to work with donors in New York and to get them to send money so that we can support the work that's happening in places like Georgia and Wisconsin and wherever. And then lo and behold, the November 2022 midterms came around and much to everybody's surprise, New York is all of a sudden a swing state from the point of view of these house districts that the GOP managed to flip. Um, so New York is it was became newly relevant to me. It took me about a month to get my mind around this, but then I was like, oh boy, we've really got to get engaged in work happening in New York. And so, as Hallie said, I started meeting with different organizations, with the Working Families Party, of course, but all the other groups, particular ones out on Long Island, where I live now, and in the Hudson Valley, and a little bit upstate. And the number one realization was that these grassroots organizations exist, but they are seriously underfunded and underinvested. And that's been true for a long time. So, even groups um, that do have a presence in those districts, just have very little money to hire the canvassers they need. So I think for me going forward, the key message, the key takeaway is that for New York in particular, the number one thing that we need to do is to start investing in the coalitions that are forming, in the tables that are existing. Um, as Working Families said, there's four regional tables now. There's also a whole C3 effort that's going on that's being led by a, a couple of different organizations. And I'm going to put my email in the chat. So if anybody wants more information about any of those, please get in touch with me and I'm happy to talk with you about it. But the number one understanding that everybody should take away is that now is the time to make your investments, uh, both from, uh, uh, from, from in Ohio and in New York for all the reasons we just discussed. And I see there's a question in there. Um, Democrats abroad. Uh, yes, I led Democrats abroad in Vietnam for a decade. I actually hosted Obama's victory party um, in a hotel on the lake where John McCain crashed during the Vietnam War. So I was in charge of uh, Democrats abroad for a little while in Vietnam. Um, so the um, couple of hundred expats that lived in Hanoi heard from me frequently about the need to get your absentee ballots in very quickly. So um, I think that's about the end of the time that I have. So I'll turn it back over to um, Billy, I think you are next. And thank you all so much. And to all my friends on this call, thank you so much for attending. And uh, we will send you information about how to make those donations. Yeah, thank you. And and John, thank you for the, the reference to um to the the perspective from being outside the United States. You know, 
there's nothing more important we can do in the world than impact um, who is in charge of the United States government for the good of not just all of us, but everyone in the world. Um, so we were talking today about a lot of really granular things in some particular states, but the bigger story here is we as a generation of people who are alive in happen to be living in the most powerful or one of the two most powerful countries in the world. We have a huge opportunity and responsibility to shape the direction of our government and with that, the, the future of the world. I wanna give an opportunity to, to Misha and Sasha um, to, to you know, weigh in one last time. Misha, um, especially to talk about like the budget and funding needs. Um, Sasha, to talk about, there were there's a whole bunch of granular questions um, in the chat that um, I want to give you a, a chance to, to respond to. In terms of the question of who should people support, people can directly support um, the work that, that Misha uh, is doing in Ohio. Um, people can directly support the Battleground New York effort um, that, that Sasha is involved in, and people can directly support uh, movement voter project, which funds lots of organizations all over the country. Um, so I want to um, I want to give you the uh, pass it to you, Misha, to just talk about the funding needs and and just like high level. These are excellent, excellent organizations and and coalitions that 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 represent so many people, and they just need the resources to bring these victories home. Passing it to you, Misha. Thanks, Billy. Um, so what we really need, is, this fight is existential in Ohio to protect ballot measures. All future fights that we have for voting rights, for redistricting, for criminal justice reform, for abortion access, everything comes down to protecting our access to ballot measures. And um, so we have what I would say is a relatively small gap of 2.6 million to meet our budget goal for this August 8th special election. And I say that that's relatively small when we're talking about the existential fight that we are in and what this means for Ohioans for the next decade plus. And as, as Billy opened about like, what does the next progressive decade look like? We're talking about how to build power in Ohio and not removing one tool that so that citizens have in state. So um, I'm going to drop our campaign uh, contribution link, which is one person, one vote, into the chat here. Um, but our biggest need right now is 2.6 million, which goes to letting voters know that there is an August 8th special election. Because again, this is a, a random date. We do not have August elections in Ohio, so voters are not thinking that there's uh, an election for them to show up to uh, where they're going to vote in July randomly, like through early votes. So we have to make sure that we're, you know, fully funded to, to turn out voters. Um, and so I really appreciate the opportunity to MVP here and Billy and Hallie and also um, Sasha, just like all the work you all are doing in a state um, we're divested in, in in opposite ways, but it is really hard when you're like making a case um, if people think your state is too red or too blue and the organizing work here has to be supported. Thank you, Misha. Thank you so much. And please send all the money to Ohio. Maybe some other places too, but you know, but Ohio really, really needs this, the resources. Um, and I want to open it up and, and um, Sasha, there are, you know, so many pretty granular questions in the chat from, from people who may be like deeply involved in New York politics and involved in, in um, local volunteer led efforts and with the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, New York is a really complex state with like a, probably a thousand local groups and you can't do everything. And there's the whole layer of the party and the national infrastructure that's that's going to do its own thing that's legally has to be separate um, from 
the work that the grassroots groups that um, that you you work with um, on the independent side. Um, so anyway, it, it, it'll be great to to give some context. Um, awesome. Yeah, happy to. And I see a lot of similar questions. So I'm going to try to summarize what I see. So one, um, folks know that there continues to be a court case around redrawing congressional maps. For folks that are not familiar, I will drop that here. Um, here's the reality. We don't know what happens with our lines in New York. They could change and we should be ready for that. And we need to continue to build base and be engaged and continue to talk to people in central New York, Long Island and the Hudson Valley period. Um, that work needs to happen. So we'll continue to monitor this case. Uh, there are a lot of important questions around timing and uh, we are remaining on top of it while we continue to talk to voters. Secondly, um, it sounds like y'all heard from uh, my friend and colleague in the movement, Lizzie Weiss, uh, either last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, who is standing up the coordinated campaign. So uh, Senator Gillibrand's infrastructure that she is um, helping to build alongside the state party incredibly important effort. We are moving alongside this effort uh, as partners uh, in the space. And also um, the state party is gonna talk to candidates and be on the coordinated side. And there are many, 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 many entities and people and voters that field and grassroots organizations like the many affiliates of the New York Working Families Party, like 1199, like CWA, like Planned Parenthood, like Indivisible. We are also going to talk to people and we are going to stay coordinated in the legally permissible way, but stay aware of each other's efforts. Um, and then the third entity, again, which I referenced um, in my remarks to start, is the infrastructure that House Majority PAC similarly is building um, big, you know, several many figure investment in New York um, uh, and um, some overlapping strategy there. So we are all in dialogue. We all understand that we all have an important critical role to play. We're continuing to coordinate on strategy. Um, and we're going to make sure that we are layering efforts rather than being in competition. Uh, because the thing that we also like in New York is to get in each other's way and say they're right and they're wrong. And guess what that led us to is losing five congressional seats in November, 2022. So our job is to make sure we are mobilizing the grassroots for folks who are representing organizations here who wanna plug in to the work um, in particular to get partner updates. Um, please drop me an email. Um, today, if you can, uh, and I'll loop you to get onto a list um, to stay engaged in partner calls. Um, this is my email here in the chat. We'll also make sure we send it out. And um, I don't have a donation link just yet, but we will very, very soon um, that we'll make sure we get to all of you. Uh, we're standing up an actual donor fund to raise that $750,000 um, by our deadline um, on June 30th and a total sum of just over $4.1 million um, for our work through March, 2024. So our colleagues at MVP will have information about that work. Uh, just bear with us as we are building the plane as we fly um, to be able to get a bank account set up uh, and have a really easy, clean act blue link like the one you saw from Misha um, to be able to give. Um, and giving early is incredibly critical. Um, so again, we live in a leaderful state. There's so many partners and allies in this work. Uh, we are engaging all of them. We are remaining in good and helpful conversation with all of them. Uh, and all of us are needed to be able to win and win big in 2024. Great. Billy, you're muted. Thank you so much, Sasha and Misha, for your incredible leadership. And it's our job now for all of us to do to move whatever resources we can, to organize as many resources as we can. And, and there will be parallel structures set up because legally there have to be between independent groups, C3 groups, uh, party organizations, they cannot coordinate with each other. So that is why there are parallel structures. And Movement Voter Project's job is not just to elect candidates, it is to support local organizations that are going to elect candidates and also and also build community organizing gear round that is going to transform the landscape in a deeper way. Um, and I meant to say Movement Voter Pack because this is a Movement Voter Pack call. Thank you, everyone. Go out there, share this. We need you to organize alongside Sasha, alongside Misha. 
and alongside our team. And together, we will get this done and build a progressive decade. And it's going to take all of us. So I want to encourage everyone to, to think big about how you can be involved and how you can organize everyone you know. Shout out to all the creative people doing things from the healthcare leaders for democracy, you know, across the board, working with MVP. We love partnering with everyone we can um, to get money to these incredible organizations on the front line. And I promised it would be an hour. And so we will end the call now.